Buongiorno ragazzi, today is a beautiful day, six weeks from the first day of spring. Today we're going to review briefly the criteria for the assignments. The first assignment, the first set of viewing notes was due last Friday. I reviewed and graded them on Saturday morning and I thought it might be useful for some of you to revisit and also see an example which is just one possible example of how the viewing notes can be executed as an assignment. After that, I'm going to show you a few minutes from the initial sequences of Detour, this week's film, and then with the help of the notes that I posted online, I'm going to talk about the film and introduce it properly on Wednesday, I will continue and go into a little bit of analysis, including visual analysis, which we didn't do much of for it happened one night because of time constraints. Also, keep in mind that I have created a simple page for the films that can be used for the final paper. And I'm planning to review it with you. And starting next week, I will present one of those films briefly every week, kind of like the Oscars ceremony, where they present the nominees for Best Feature Film one at a time during the night. So that by spring break, you will have an idea, and perhaps you can start picking a film, uh, getting ideas on what to include in the paper, what to analyze, and we'll discuss the format, of course. Today I have a new rig, because the angle from the table is not favorable. It adds 10 pounds to my slim figure. Uh, however, uh, I didn't bring the tool to tighten this tablet holder in position. So if during the lecture you see it going down, just scream and I'll jump and catch it. Okay? Because it, it is as stiff as butter. Uh, it's just a balancing act right now. Okay? Notice the small changes that I have made. If you go to week three, I have created a separate page where I store the prompts and the instructions for the viewing notes, which were previously found inside week one, and I would include a bookmark to send you there. Now you have this separate page. It's basically the same with a few more notes, right? This is the prompts, right? Where to post the viewing notes, I added something about the length since there was a question the last time, put there from the syllabus. And keep in mind, we don't have a midterm, we don't have quizzes, but practically every week you have a written assignment to complete. Of course, the deadline is Friday. You don't have to ruin your Friday by doing it at the last moment. If you complete your assignment ahead of time, please add a comment saying, I'm done, so that I can review it before the deadline and put a grade there. I've made sure not to include a written assignment on the week before spring break because I know that uh, there are many midterms, most classes have midterms uh, that week. And of course, besides the viewing notes, we will have three so-called film essays and we'll talk about them when the first one comes along. Etc. And here you have a so-called matrix, including the link to the 
segment of a YouTube video where I talked about it during the first week and I added, I tried to clarify and expand these notes a little bit. Second thing that I added was a link to a Google Docs file under my name, which I used as a demo. And there I placed one example of viewing notes. So, if you saw comments attached to the grade you received, to the effect of pay attention to the example that will be provided and what will be said in class on Monday, this is something for you. At the same time, keep in mind, if you followed a different template and you still got an A or an A minus, it's fine because I could not myself live under the imposition of one template and only one to follow. But if you're not there, if you're doing your assignment by completely different criteria and probably your grade reflects that, then this is an opportunity to rethink. Notice that I've used bullet points. I've said many times you don't have to use a narrative format because they're viewing notes. The idea is I'm watching the film and while I'm watching or right after that, I put down these notes. Preferably, I stop the film because I've watched it once already, so I'm not spoiling the experience, but the second time I stop because I've noticed something that is relevant, relevant for this class. Abdul, please. And I put down a paragraph, a short paragraph, a few notes, right, again, this is not a full-fledged analysis of the film. It shows, first of all, that you watched the film. You didn't just read a synopsis, or you didn't just ask uh, open chat GPT or some other AI tool to write the review for you. And it shows, right? I've already had one example last semester, probably one this semester. Uh, it, it's artificial intelligence, but intelligence is a big term, especially when you submit something to a professor, right? So it shows that you watch the film, it shows that you understand the work that we're doing on this genre or films. That is to say, you're not giving me generic info of the kind you can find on Wikipedia or a thousand other sites, right? Because chances are you cannot find another site that uses the same matrix, the same approach, the same ideas that we're employing in this class. And this kind of assignment is, is not just to uh, keep me satisfied, but it's there to track your progress in the understanding of a set of specific ideas. So you don't have to include a summary of the film, for example, or any other kind of introduction. However, if you do, and keep in mind that these, these notes are longer than you need to make them. I just wanted to provide a range of examples to cover different areas and different issues. So, as I said, you don't have to include an introduction or a summary of the film, but if you do, make it smart. Make it a summary that takes certain elements from the story and shows your understanding of the story instead of a generic. Uh, thing, right? So, notice that in here, and I wasn't trying to be very professorial, okay? Be very formal. I was trying to maintain a low to average kind of style, okay? But this is what I put. Ellie, and, and I use It Happened One Night, right? Which was the first assignment. Ellie, rebellious, spoiled brat, runs away from a millionaire father, no mother, 
spends a few days on the road and gets a humorous education about being thrifty, being on time, dunking a donut, hitchhiking, not being picky with food, well forced by the circumstances, travel with a stranger, Peter. Notice that it's just a few lines, but there are a lot of details, more details than you would find in any short synopsis of the movie found online. There are some observations that you might not find online. For example, there is no mother, right? Which is very common in Hollywood movie of all kinds. From this one, no mother, to Harry Potter, no parents at all. Notice that I'm not trying to be academic, meaning I have to treat this formally, because let's be clear on one thing. This is a comedy, a farcical comedy. In fact, the specific genre is called <coughs> screwball comedy. And therefore, I added a humorous education. And, and this is also clear from uh, the examples I provided. Okay, this is not biblical teachings about life. And if we miss the humor, then it might seem a movie that is preaching about the role of the husband and the role of the wife, when it's not exactly, okay? And I continued, he gets an education, etc., etc. But very little about the summary, but what I put there is significant. Then I suggested, when you work on the viewing notes, keep in mind the so-called matrix, the main ideas, the road, impersonation, transformation, destinations. However, you don't have to use that as a cage, as a rigid grid for that. Just keep those ideas in mind and let the movie guide you. So for example, in here I said, well, I'll, I'll add a section on the places, right? Because there are various places, and each place is a segment that is associated with a kind of event or transformation, partial transformation or lesson, humorous lesson about life. So for example, different rules, different standards of social interaction, and I said, let's focus on control, right? For the character of Helly. So, Clearly, I have the yacht, and in the yacht, I have a hierarchy of power. And, and very schematically, again, just enough to give an idea. When I read it, I might tell the student, Andrea, maybe these notes are a bit too essential. Maybe you could word them uh, a little more clearly. But it's fine. Basically, it is fine. So on the yacht, there is a hierarchy of power. On top of this hierarchy, you find the father, the millionaire, Mr. Andrews, and Ellie at the same time, because of course, Ellie is confined to her room under his father's authority. But Ellie is fighting this authority, and it's clear that in their relationship, sometimes it is Ellie who places herself, manages to get to the top of the hierarchy. Then you find the captain, the crew, the staff, etc. Right? And by the time she reaches the station of the night bus, what does she have left of that authority and control? She has a little bit of money, enough to have the ticket purchased by the old lady, and then she thinks she can buy people with money. For example, tries that with Peter, but doesn't get very far. Right? She's already losing control. And then you get to the inside of the bus, and, and the lack of control is plenty clear visually. Right, You have the fat man sleeping on her shoulder. She cannot control that. She has this guy from New Jersey flirting with her heavily. And, and she can defend herself, but to a point. Then she gets to the auto camp, and that's another test of her power and control of the situation. She stays outside, out of the rain. She, she doesn't want to uh, be controlled by Peter, but then this cannot be sustained for long. She has to go inside, and, and she's forced to experience this kind of proximity or intimacy with Peter, right? And then they have to play this pretend game, which 
is connected to what we said about impersonation. But again, notice that I'm not really doing impersonation. They do this and that, which is fine if that agrees with your approach. Again, I'm not saying that this is the only template. And choose a template that suits your background, your interest, your style, etc., so that this doesn't become too heavy a, uh, an assignment. Okay? Make this work for you. And notice that I have different paragraphs in reference to scenes, different scenes from the movie. I'm not commentating on every scene. Clearly, that would be too much. But I'm not picking just one or two scenes. Because again, how do I know you watch the entire film, right? Although even by picking a few scenes through the references, an idea can be had in here. I'm commenting on the scene where uh, this poor lady going to New York for a job during the years following the Great Depression faints because she and her son have not had any food since the day before. The kid is screaming, help my mother. And, and the kid is then explaining this critical situation there in to Peter. And Peter takes out the only bill left the only money they have left, Peter and Ellie, which means that he's thinking about the giving the kid money, although he knows from this crumpled bill that this is the only thing in their pocket. She comes over. She sees the money. They're both supporting the kid morally, psychologically, but then she sees the money. She picks the money and gives it to the kid. So they're acting jointly. Not only they're acting jointly, but they're reading each other's intentions. So they're in sync like a couple in a public place. And this is what I try to put inside my brief comment about that. I try to do the same about the scene in which they're in the old man's car, the man who is singing, who turns out to be a thief, someone who picks up hitchhiker and then steals their luggage. And I made reference to the story in here. And I did the same for a few more of these scenes so that you can have an idea. Again, don't make it as long. You don't need to make it as long as this one. I just wanted to provide a range of examples. OK? But it would be overkill for the assignment itself. I want to see you also, whenever possible, I add a visual reference. This is a film. It's not just a story, right? After separating from Ellie, he, Peter, is drinking again in the shot where we see multiple bottles on a side table while he is sitting in a chair reading newspaper articles about her marriage. Right? It's a critical moment for him. However, what can we say about this? He's drinking by himself, so at least he's not a bad example to other or a public nuisance as he was while at the bus station at the beginning of the film. So again, I'm talking about visual elements. I'm talking about elements of transformation, right? How the character evolves throughout the film. So if you want to, if you need to, please have a look at these notes. They're accessible. Of course, you need a Stony Brook login, meaning Anyone with a Stonebrook login can click on this link. Feel free, once you review my comments, feel free to add questions, asking me to clarify, to expand, or ask me the next time around to review a draft ahead of time. And if I have time, and I've done it for a couple of people, I will do so and, and leave comments and suggestions for improvement whenever appropriate. Keep in mind that I marked where you put Peter lowercase or Ellie lowercase, where you didn't put the apostrophe for the S, Ellie's father. Not only because I'm a university professor and therefore I'm like the grammar Nazi from the college humor video. If you haven't seen this, find Google 
college humor, because the, the website, I think, went down. Uh, and Grammar Nazi, it's based on Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. It's a beautiful video, one of the best I've made. It's not just my fixation. It's a formal kind of text you're writing in some ways. Right? And imagine yourself, two years from now, working in an office, how would it go down if you wrote your boss's name with lowercase, or a customer's name with lowercase, or their company without the proper capitalization? Or if you sent a customer that is worth a million dollars a message where wasn't and couldn't, don't have an apostrophe? Because clearly, for these things, they invented the spell checker? You just have to enable it in your browser? if you work in a browser or in your text editor. So really, they put wavy red lines and you click and it fixes itself. Okay, that's the good artificial <coughs> intelligence. They even have grammatical suggestions that are often good, not always. Finally, keep in mind that this class gives you satisfaction of the writing WRTD category of the Stony Brook curriculum, and therefore you have to try to do your best in these assignments, okay? Because what's the point otherwise? I'm here to help you. If you're one of the few who missed that deadline altogether, perhaps you didn't expect it, uh, you didn't think of it, you have until Monday tonight, actually, Today is Monday. You have until tonight, by the end of the day, if I find your assignment tomorrow morning, I will grade it as if you had met the deadline. Next time around, don't miss the deadline. If you need to, request an extension, which is legitimate on a few occasions, because there are things in everyone's life that can prevent you from finishing a work on time. If you don't submit by the deadline, this Friday, and you don't request an extension, you will receive a penalty if you finish it by Monday. After the Monday, after a deadline, I will not accept an assignment unless an extension was granted. Okay? Any questions before moving on? Any questions about the assignments? Okay? Good. Okay. So, Detour, 1945. A great little movie. Let's have first an idea, in case you haven't seen it yet, and then I'll introduce the viewing note, but at least you have a sense of the visual style and the acting. anything? What did you see from camera movements, lights, etc.? Some observations? Alex? I like the, the Vaseline on the lens moments <laughs> that they had. Yeah, probably not even Vaseline. <laughs> Just lens. Well, they, they had a propensity for, they weren't going for contrast. Contrast is a modern thing, and now with digital, it's everything. But they weren't really trying to make it as contrast as it could be. So it, it was probably a combination of the kind of second-rate lens, because the production was a low-budget production. This is a B-movie by Hollywood standards. And also uh, the insufficient, inadequate lighting. However, the lighting itself was a choice. Not because they didn't have enough lights to illuminate, but... What do you do when you don't have money to spend on a set? You lower the light so that the people will not see that it's super fake. For example, did you see New York? Because they're in New York. They're walking outside. They didn't say Riverside and 72nd. Of course you didn't see New York because there was what? Fog. Fog. So much fog at some point you don't even see the characters. You lose them completely because they've flooded the set. And again, it, they're not out in the open. They're in a studio. They flooded the set with fog. So you just see the signs, and you see them twice. I'm not even sure that they've changed the signs because I couldn't read 
So maybe it's the same sign. They reuse a lot of film in here as they used to all the time. If they didn't reuse film inside the same film, they would reuse film inside another film. Do I need a shot of London? Well, I have one from a film from 1948. I'll use that. London Street or the, the port or something else. So you, you see a lot of fog. You see uh, a milk cart, right? The carriage of the milkman because they're outside at dawn after 4 a.m. And inside the nightclub, how do you see it's a very cheaply made film? The, the set, how do you know they're in a nightclub? Do you at all? Because what you see is a very small corner, very tight space for the band, right? They're on top of each other, really. And the piano, of course, in the forefront, because you have to emphasize the main male character of Al. But then in the back, you don't even see the walls and the lights of a nightclub. You see a curtain. Because again, there is nothing there. There is no wall there. There is just a curtain to create the illusion of a space. So already you see some things. A cheaply made film, a B movie. And you see a rough use of the light, right? Dark and light, heavily contrasted not to enhance the sharpness of the image, but cr to create a mood. And this is a film noir. A film noir is very much based on mood. Also, if you consider this closely, there is something slightly unsettling about the whole narrative from the get-go, right? And keep in mind, we don't see anything, we don't know anything about the main character past this background, this, this flashback this background story that he was working in a place in New York. He was in love and living together with Sue, the blonde uh, singer, who was an actress and a singer in real life. But you don't know anything about his past history, right? Or what kind of a man he is. And you see, before you see this, you see him getting into a squabble with a customer in this diner, in Reno, but again, there is something, there is a certain uneasiness about the story itself and about the character, which is unusual because even for evil characters, a Hollywood movie, movie and wants to create some kind of connection, right? Which might be is evil, but very charismatic, evil, but incredibly smart or evil, but beautiful rich, successful, etc. Nothing there of the sort, right? So let's go back to the uh, notes and I'll continue from there for the time that I have left today. And I'm using this page, right? I should find link to the website. Okay, I started with a few notes about the director, who was an Eastern European director, came to Hollywood like many other European, and especially Eastern European directors. He had worked with some of the masters, some of the pioneers. Murnau, he worked with, made the masterpiece Nosferatu, which has been made many times as a very successful vampire film. One in a long series, another one will be made in 1930 or 1931 with the title of Dracula. And The Last Laugh is incredible from a cinematic standpoint. It's a little drama about a doorman, an old man, whose only pride in life is that he's the doorman outside of a posh hotel, and therefore he's dressed for the part, and he can tell others that he's around rich people, and then he's demoted to the washroom, to the restroom, right? And everything ensues from, from there. Murnau died, so he couldn't continue to be the mentor to um, uh, Ulmer. And Ulmer shot this, had a big success with the Black Cat, which you can find on Amazon. And it's incredibly uh, nice horror movie. Uh, and once you see it, you see the template for maybe 20 other films shot between the 1970s and now. Not exactly the same story, but very similar. 
um, the black cat is not really the most important component. They used it because it's the title of a short story by Edgar Allan Poe. The movie has nothing to do with it. It's a couple, a, a newly married couple. He's a psychologist or a psychiatrist. She's a younger woman, and they're going to Eastern Europe, and they meet this uh, person from Hungary who's going back home after spending 15 or 16 years as a war prisoner, a World War I war prisoner in Siberia, and is going there for a vendetta. And everything goes down, of course, after they leave the station to go to a place that is supposed to be the, 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 the place of a friend and a com com comrade of, of this guy they meet. And in there you find a couple that will act together in six or in seven or eight movies during the 1930s. Big stars during the time. Bela Lugosi specialized in horror films, especially with vampires. Boris Karloff did Frankenstein. I don't know if you've ever seen Frankenstein. I saw it as a kid in Italy, dubbed in Italian, and I got nightmares for, for years from, from uh, Boris Karloff uh, playing the, the monster in, in Frankenstein. And even if you see Young Frankenstein uh, by Mel Brooks, a lot of situations are taken from these films. So what happened? Omer had this success, but then he was blackballed in Hollywood because he stole the wife of someone who was connected to the studios. It was the wife of the nephew of the head of Universal. And therefore, after that, out of respect for the family of the head of Universal, nobody would give him a contract. None of the <coughs> big studios would give him a contract. And he ended up doing B-movies for the rest of his life in what was called Poverty Row, which was a metaphor for, for the area where the small studios, the small sets, uh, were there. Interestingly, there is another uh, sad story connected to the film. The main actor that you've seen, the guy with the face, uh, all uh, uh, traversed by strong lights and strong shadows, Tom Neal, had a bit of a temper problem. He had a long career as an amateur boxer, and uh, he, he punched too many people into the hospital, into the emergency room, to the point where by the early 1950s, and already at that time, the only big success he had was Detour. By the early 1950s, nobody wanted to hire him because of his temper. They were afraid that he would punch people on the set, uh, or, or even a producer. And um, he ended up working as a gardener. Then he married a woman, a regular woman, not an actress. And she was found dead in his house shot in the head, and probably he killed her. But he was still a minor celebrity, so he got off in 1965 at a trial with mans manslaughter, unintentional manslaughter. He said, we were fighting, she grabbed the gun. Uh, mm, mm, maybe not. And he died right, to, uh, right after he came out of prison. He did six years, come, came out, went back to doing the, working as a gardener, and had a heart attack one day. Um, so a lot of sad careers in connected to this film. The film is based on a novel published in 1939. The novel itself was not, has never been particularly successful to this day. Uh, and uh, of course, you can still find it in, in electronic version. Um, and Goldsmith worked on the screenplay. The film itself became a cult film, and it was an inspiration for a lot of future directors as one of the first acknowledged film noirs. And I'll talk about the standards that define a film as a, as a, as a film noir. Poverty Row, as I said, you can read the article on Wikipedia. It's not a real place. It's a metaphor to say these are the studios with no money. but Actually, they were working more or less, more, most of them on the same area. 
According to the lore, to the legend, the film was shot in only six days. It's only about 66 minutes long or so. Actually, it might have been 14 days. And it only cost $88,000. Keep in mind that Happened One Night cost four times that much in 1934, 11 years earlier. Okay? So, does it mean that if you don't have a big budget, the film is low quality? Technically, it is, right? Have you seen the camera movements when they're in the nightclub? Zoom and move. You don't do that in the same shot. Or if you want to, it's hard to pull a stunt like that. You really need a cinematographer who knows how to use the camera. And you cannot use a dolly if you're, if you're doing all these movements. It becomes more difficult. Why they were doing this when they should have done different shots and then edited them together? Because they only had film is expensive, not just the stars, especially at that time. They only had twice as many meters of film as the ones they needed for a full film. Meaning, if they had a scene that lasted five minutes, what they had available was 10 minutes of film to put in the camera, which means they could shoot twice or three times only certain segments or certain scenes. And we've talked about the thrifty sets, the overuse of fog, darkness, curtains, etc. They recycled frames, so when you see another flashback, he, at some point, the character will hitchhike, will be picked up by a gambler going to California to bet on a horse. His name is Haskell, and Haskell dies. Uh, is, is, was he dead before he fell out of the car and hit his head, or uh, he died because of Al's sudden move of opening the door of the car without considering the consequences. That's one of the crucial issues in the film. Later on, he has a nightmare about the night in which the person who gave him the ride died. And that is the same film uh, reproposed to you. And there are small continuity issues, meaning, for example, the dress from one scene to another that are contiguous adjacent is not the same, right? that kind of thing. And PRC only produced B-movies. So you can read more about what a B-movie is. It's, it's, it was a popular, popular commercial category at that time. We still have B-movies. We even have C-movies. But they're not significant at the theater as they were at that time. Meaning, of course, they go to straight to DVD, they used to, or straight to streaming. They may be shown in a theater only one weekend, if that much. At, the, at that time, uh, it was common to show two films for the same price. You get one ticket and you see two films. One is a good film, the other is a B-movie. But it's a way to spend an afternoon. A lot of people spend a lot of time in theaters. So B-movie is low budget, it's not meant to be artistic, and uh, is distributed differently. Film noir, and again, you can read, you can click the link and read more, but uh, there are hundreds or thousands of articles about what is a, a film noir. And the first issue is, is a film noir a genre, really? Or is it just a style? applicable to the story and to the uh, visual elements. Because even in literature, you have Le Con Noir, which is the dark story, meaning a story with a very dark atmosphere, uh, a certain kind of treatment of the conclusion, etc. According to some scholars, it's just a mood, meaning it's a certain kind of Use it to, to use a metaphor in, in the story. And these are some of the categories that can be applied to a film noir. There is cruelty, sometimes cruelty, against the character itself, the main characters. There is ambiguity or ambivalence 
So there, are, there is no clear cut judgment uh, that can be rendered. Is it, it is oniric, there is a dreamlike quality to the film itself. And, and we've seen it even in the intro to uh, Detour that we watched, right? There is a certain lack of realism. It's off, the best way to put it. So it can be strange in some ways or chaotic. And it can be erotic, which is only true for some of the scenes here, but more than anything, it's erotic tension, not, not that they're showing body parts, okay? It's also a kind of film that is readable. On one level, the story is very basic. However, it is ambiguous about the larger significance, right? Or ambiguous in terms of the questions that are not answered or the narrative gaps that are left there. And the patterns in terms of theme or visual are very evident. They're in your face. In this case, what is the theme of the film? Lack, fate, chance. Because the main issue is, is Al's life, the life of Al, the protagonist, governed by fate? governed by chance, governed by circumstances? Is he really not at all in control, not at all responsible for what happens to him, and in particular for the death of two people, the person who gave him a ride and another person, a woman, to whom he, Al, gave a ride? Read this quote from Road Movies. I will not comment on it. Something else that we saw during the credits that is significant. We saw a road, which is very common for the beginning of a movie. You find any number of films showing a road, but never, almost never, they show the road behind. Because what you've seen there is not the road ahead. You don't see the car, but clearly we're on a road, we're on a car, but you see the road behind you which is a beautiful visual metaphor for the theme of the film, meaning what is fixed, the only thing that you can control is the past. And of course, you have no control over it. The road ahead, you have no real sense of direction in this kind of metaphor. It's not you in control. The past is fixed, the road ahead is mysterious. Okay? And, okay, I'll, there are a few more comments that you can read on your own and uh, about this as well. So even the reference when he's in the diner and he gets angry because he hears from the jukebox uh, the, the, the song that he and Sue used to play and she used to sing to him or in his mind she was singing to him but she, she wasn't. She wasn't in love with him clearly. Uh, he gets angry because the music is being played and it's like the path is haunting him. It's like this music is a big joke, taunting him about a, some kind of Eden life or Eden, Edenic life conditions that he lost. Reminds him of what in his past is lost forever. Any chance of a relationship with um, with her, right? So from the beginning, even this is a reference to the other issue. We talked about fate and chance and luck. Is Al's life governed by luck? Is he really completely passive? Is there anything that he can do to remedy this situation? Okay, and there are a few more notes that you can follow in here. So, like most film noirs, there is a very basic pattern. In this case, the trope that you find in a gazillion Hollywood movies fall from grace, right? Supposedly, there was a condition of happiness. Al was working as a pianist, and the, the pay was not that bad for those times, meaning recession or something like that or the war and Sue was in love with her 
it is also quite easy to dismantle this narrative because we saw that they leave the well first of all you see that she's singing behind him so there is only a partial connection but they leave this place and she says we don't have money we're not successful i want to go to california become an actress and she never says come with me he never says i'll come with you or I'll, I'll find a way to make money, to make more money, right? So even this supposed condition of perfect harmony in their lives is only supported by the claim of the character. But if you get this about the film, then every other claim, for example, that he's not responsible for the death of these two people he encounters on the road, can also be dismantled. Right? It makes you question whether the story is believable or it's just a story of someone who is not able to acknowledge their responsibility in serious acts. I'll stop here. As usual, I'll be in my office or for quick questions, you can approach me now. Okay? Enjoy the rest of your day.